my name is Ed Eikhoff, and I am the chair of the Economics Department Board of Advisors. I am an Oakland University uh, graduate from the Economics Department back in 1985, just a few years ago. So I've seen the university change a lot over the years. The Oakland uh, University Board of Advisors has been in existence. This is our 15th year. And we started the fall lecture series uh, 12 years ago, so this is our actual 12th uh, fall lecture. Other things that the board does is we provide an annual scholarship, uh, we provide a faculty award, we uh, guest speak at some of your classes, uh, we have a mentorship program, we do mock interviews. Uh, so we try and be a, a, an active board for you, and we try and make ourselves available to the student organizations if you're involved in uh, ESA or WESA. So on behalf of uh, the Board of Advisors, I welcome you here tonight. And I have the great pleasure of introducing um, a colleague and a very dear friend who is going to uh, speak for us tonight. Nick Ijelanian is considered a leading expert on retail and the shopping center industry. He pioneered the segmentation of retail into commodity and specialty genres and first wrote on the pending failure of the U.S. regional mall industry as the author of the retail chapter of the Urban Land Institute's Professional Real Estate Development in 2012. He has spent over 30 years in the shopping center industry starting in 1988. As president of SiteWorks, he has advised a wide array of retail clients including Joseph A. Bank, Starbucks, among others. He also advises a wide array of shopping center owners and developers throughout North America. Mr. Ejelaine is an industry thought leader and frequent speaker and writer on retail trends and the evolution of the retail and shopping center industries and is published in numerous retail and shopping center industry publications. He's currently in his seventh year teaching retail theory and development as an adjunct professor in the Colvin Real Estate Depart Development Graduate Program within uh, UMD, the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation in College Park, Maryland. He holds a Doctor of Law degree from the Georgetown University National Law Center. So my friend and colleague, Nick, the floor is yours. Okay, so we're going to talk about how shopping centers work, and we're going to also talk about the myths of information you get about shopping centers. And I will tell you that about 90% of the information you're getting on shopping center and retail is not accurate. How is that possible that you're getting inaccurate information at that, that level? Let's start uh, in the present, and then we're going to go back in time. In 19 or in 2019, the end of the year, does anyone know what percentage of retail in the United States was happening on the internet? And just y'all have guesses if you're not, you don't have to know, just give me your guesses. What percentage of retail was happening by internet retail at the end or the beginning of 2020? 15. 60%? 60 15. 15? 30. 30, 90? 75. 70? 95. 95? Would I be accurate if I said on average the group probably thinks it's 50 to 60, maybe 70 percent? Okay. So would it surprise you to know that it was 11.9 percent? Now, guess what catalog sales were as a percentage of retail sales in 1994? Exactly the same number. So from 1994 to 2020, all that happened was catalog sales became internet sales. That's it. And most of you weren't old enough to know the catalogs back then, but there were big catalogs, and there were companies that sold on, out of catalogs just like Amazon does. Uh, the model was different. They didn't have all the extras, and they didn't offer next day service. They actually made money because they charged for shipping. Amazon makes no money on retail, and it only commands about one and a quarter percent of all retail sales in the United States. You may have heard recently that it's bigger than Walmart, but that's not true. It's only bigger than Walmart if you count all the things it does that are not retail. So we're going to start with a couple of what I call prologues to get you uh, some basic terminology and some basic understanding of how retail works. So prologue one, we already know, we talked about it. That's the retail narrative, right? It's an apocalypse. And that is what shopping centers look like, right? We've all seen that a million times, right? And it's all being killed by digital, right? Of course, I just told you that that's not true. 
that all that happened in 25 years was Amazon migrated what used to be catalog sales to internet sales. And the only difference is there wasn't an internet back in 1994 that was usable the way it is today. So you either had to call in or mail it, and the internet made it much easier to place the order. It also gave them the ability to have an endless catalog. What is retail? I mean, you know it's stuff you buy in the store, right? Well, what makes it retail as opposed to wholesale, as opposed to uh, barter, as opposed to borrowing? So retail is like the resale of something bought. You said, you got it. It's resale, right? Yeah. So somebody's buying it. Who's buying it first? The owner and then he's selling it. The retailer. And, and what do they pay for it? Right, they pay a wholesale price. So here's how we do it. There are three things that have to occur for there to be a retail transaction. First, the retailer, the seller, has to buy the product at wholesale. Did a great job getting to that answer. Okay, buy it at wholesale. You buy it in bulk. Walmart buys hundreds of millions of units of each thing it buys. And that way it can negotiate the price down. It buys at a fraction of what it sells to you for. And then it marks it up and it sells it to you at what? At retail. Retail is the full price. The price you can buy one unit at after the, after the retailer buys it in bulk and breaks it down. Make sense? Okay. But that's not all. Anybody work in retail? So if you work in retail, you know this. The two things that determine whether retail is, pro retail is profitable or not are one, the margin. You know what the margin is? What's the margin? It's the difference between the wholesale price and the retail price. He bought it for a dollar, he sold it for a dollar and a quarter, the margin is 25%, right? He made 25% of what he paid for. And what determines then whether, you got to get 25 cents. What determines whether you're going to be profitable? Operating costs. And what's the biggest operating cost? Labor. So the third and most misunderstood part of retail is the customer provides the labor. Right? You go to a store, you walk in the store, these days how much help do you get? Not a lot. What's the chance you're going to get any help at a grocery store? If you don't ask, you're never going to get help, right? The only place you, you're going to get help maybe is at the, at the uh, deli counter, right? And when you go to check out these days, what do you encounter at the checkout? Self-checkout. Self Why is there self-checkout that wasn't there 10 years ago? Because they're cutting labor cost. So essential to retail is you do all the work. And it used to be you'd get all the work picking stuff off the shelf and putting it in your cart and then putting it in your car. But now they even have you doing the checkout. The most expensive labor in a store is the checkout person. So they transfer it to you and they make the bet that they're going to save more money on the people they don't have to pay to check you out, then they're going to lose in shrink. You know what shrink is in retail? Shrink is stealing. Shrink is, is in inventory that gets eaten up without getting sold. It's stalled, it spoils, whatever. Okay? So that's the three things you have to have for retail. So when you have someone picking an order for you at a store, is that really retail? When you order curbside pickup and someone is in the store going aisle by aisle picking your order into nine bags, it's not really retail, is it? Someone's doing it for you. When it shows up at your house, you're not doing any labor, right? Okay, it is technically retail, but it's not following a profitable retail model when the customer doesn't do the labor. And all through history, very few retail chains are profitable if the customer doesn't do the labor, unless they charge for the labor that they substitute. So in the old days when the catalog business was 
there instead of the internet business, they always charge shipping and handling and it averages about 25% of the sale price. So when Amazon doesn't charge you that, there's about 25% they're not getting. And what are they increasingly doing these days? Raising prices, right? They're burying the shipping cost in there so they can actually try to make money. Because you just can't do it without, you can't provide the labor and make money in retail. All right, next promo. What is retail? How big is retail? Well, in the United States, retail is a $5.5 trillion a year business. That is what's sold at retail. That represents about 24% of the U.S. economy. But if you add in the manufacturing, the construction, the operation, the shipping, all of it comes to about 75% of the U.S. economy. 75% of the U.S. economy is related to retail. And that's the rate retail grows at annually and has over the last 50 to 75 years. 4.5% a year. Doesn't sound like a dying business to me, does it? See that dip? The only time in that 50, 60 year period that retail took a substantial dip was during the Great Recession. And when you see a dip like that in a retail, in a retail chart, what does that tell you? People are really hurting. Because it won't dip that far unless people can't afford to buy things they need. Okay, so when you see a dip like that, people are suffering. And what was happening during the Great Recession? People were losing their houses, right? They were moving in with friends, losing jobs. We had really high unemployment. We had a recession greater than the recession of 1929 that preceded the Great Depression. And so you had a dip like that when you have literally cutting into the bone of what people need to survive. And that's, the real, that's a chart, uh, most recent chart from eMarketer. eMarketer is one of the most reliable uh, measurers of retail sales. And as you can see, what's really interesting is, obviously in 2020, retail sales dropped, right? But it didn't drop as much as you'd think, right? You literally couldn't go into stores for half the year. But look, it only dropped six, eight percent. Why is that? Uh, no. Online shopping played a role, but that's not why that is. The, why, the reason that is is because about 80 to 90 percent of all retail sales are things you need to live. They are not sources of pleasure. They're things you need to live. So what people cut out was pleasure shopping. But they couldn't cut out needs shopping. So it only fell 6, 8 percent. And then what happens in 2021? It actually goes up higher. Right, because they deferred spending in 2020. And then what happens in 2022 and beyond? It goes right back to normal. And that's what happens in retail all through history. Because the majority of retail sales are what people need, they're not optional. This is the world, and the world represents an $80 trillion a year economic machine about 25% of the world's economy is retail. It's about $20 trillion. But again, if you add in everything else, it's about 70% of the world economy. And that is a breakdown of who are the biggest participants in the economic system, which equates to retail. That, that's actually not retail, that's all GDP. But as you can see, the United States is biggest, but look who's right behind China. Now, China has almost four times as many people as the United States. So we are a big time consuming country. We consume at a rate greater than anyone else in the world. So we are a very, very important economy to the world, not just to us, to the world. Because we all know it's a world economy, right? That cat's out of the bag. Stuff you buy at Walmart, what's the most common place it comes from? China. China. Um, what are two or three of the others that are very common? Yeah. Mexico? Canada? Surprisingly, the United States is in the top six or eight. Vietnam's the fastest growing one. 
But it's amazing how few countries actually make consumer goods. That 80 or 90 percent of all the consumer goods in the world come out of less than 10 countries. Everyone else is consuming. This is worldwide retail sales, and as I said, there it is in 2024 to reach $30 trillion. So is retail a non-important business? What does retail do every day? It feeds people. It clothes people. It's gas in their cars. It's a vitally important business, and I'm going to show you that. So these are the five essential industries for the world to work every day. If any of these industries break that breaks down, stops working, for even a day, chaos ensues. So if you if you want to play the evil doctor in uh, a James Bond movie, disrupt one of these five. Energy. Those are some depictions of how energy moves around the world. The whole world is connected. Electricity through power grids. Oil moves through the oceans, tankers, pipelines. And if it stops moving for a day, what happens? What would happen in the stock market if Overnight, there was no power anywhere in the world. Ships stopped moving, electricity just stopped. It'd be chaos, right? You wouldn't leave your house, right? Excuse me? It would plummet. And you'd be scared. Because you turn on a switch and nothing happens. Your car's empty on gas. No more gas. The world is screwed down. Second one is banking. When the Great Recession occurred, I think it was 2009, Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed. Mm -hmm. Happened on Friday. Anybody know what happened over that weekend? The US government bailed out a company called AIG. You know why they bailed out AIG? Because every major bank in the world had instruments called collateralized debt instruments that were going to become worthless Monday morning. So every bank in the world was going to collapse on Monday morning after Lehman Brothers fell. If they had not propped up AIG over the weekend. And if that happened, what would have happened? What would have happened on Monday? Chaos. Chaos. Worldwide panic, right? No money. We were one day away from it. One day away from it. And you would have gone to your ATM and what would have happened? If there was power, there wouldn't have been any money in it. Wouldn't have given you any money. What's the third one? Communications. Every single thing you do relies on communication, right? Now you can't even go to a concert with a, with a paper ticket because they want, to, they want you to go with an electronic ticket on your phone, right? And if your phone's dead, no concert. And if the communication grid collapses, no concert. And if you go to the store to buy something, you go to the terminal and you wave your credit card, the communication's down. Everybody in the airport when their computers are down? Chaos. Everything's connected. Picture on the right, everything's connected. You take down one key piece of that infrastructure, and life is over, as you know it, that day, that moment in time. Medical services. You can argue that medical service is not essential because medical service, if it goes away, it doesn't 100% it doesn't stop everything at that moment, right? But over time, it would wreak havoc. 
So I include it. Some people say maybe it's not as essential as you know, some of the other things. But let's assume it, it's essential. And finally, retail. Because what would happen if every store tomorrow was closed? Indefinitely. Can't buy anything. Can you get anything? So let me be clear. Retail is the only one that touches each one of the others. And in most cases, delivers the others. Banks are in shopping centers. Cellular phone stores are in shopping centers. Gasoline stations are at or next to shopping centers. Urgent care in shopping centers. And since retail is 25% of the economy, and with all other things included, 80% of the economy, 75 or 80%, I would say there is no more important one than retail, right? It's the infrastructure in many cases that at least partially delivers some of the other. And of course, if you can't buy gas, if you can't buy food, and what's behind all that? One of the most complex distribution systems imaginable. Think about the wonder of 60,000 products in a grocery store being delivered to you fresh every day, coming from all around the world in thousands of grocery stores. Think about what's involved in just getting one store to operate well and not have everything spoiling on the shelves. And to get stuff there when it's fresh and edible. And you only have a two or three day window in which those strawberries are just right, right? It's remarkable. This is not an unimportant, silly industry. It's probably the most important industry in the world. Okay, let's get on to the actual lecture. Now you have the background. All you have is the background. So here's, here's how shopping in the United States evolved. So before the 1950s, there were downtowns. Before there were downtowns, there were, there were uh, rural uh, crossroads. And at the crossroads, there were general stores, and over time as cities got bigger, they, general stores morphed into department stores. And that's what you see on the left, a 1940s era department store. If you wanted to buy stuff in the 1940s and 50s, you had to go downtown. What was the big downtown department store here that they're now building a building that's named after? Hudson's. Some of these department stores got as big as 900,000 square feet. And there's a name for them. The name for them is a term of art that if I hadn't learned from a friend of mine who's 80 years old and lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and started at JCPenney in 1966, I would never have been able to put this lecture together. They were called full-line department stores. Full-line department stores carried everything. If you go back and look at Sears, Sears once had a tagline that said, Sears has everything. Anybody remember that? You guys are too young, too young for that. But that was literally the tagline of Sears. Sears has everything. Sears was also the largest catalog company in the country back in the 1960s and 70s. It was the Walmart of its era. And there were well over 100, 150 independent department stores that were homegrown from all over the country. They were full-line department stores, and they had over a hundred departments in most, literally the Walmarts of their day. And they were in downtowns, and when you go to the second picture, they became the backbones of the regional malls in the United States back in the 1960s. And what precipitated that? What caused us to build 3,000 malls? What didn't exist before those 3,000 malls were built? An interstate highway system. It was the building of the roads during the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s that created the mall era of shopping. Because once they started building roads, people could leave the cities, 
They could buy cheaper land, they could build bigger houses. Once they started leaving the cities, they needed the same services that were in the cities. And eventually you get to the modern grid you see today. And pretty much everything you see today in terms of roads and infrastructure didn't exist before 1955. So the shopping center industry is less than 75 years old. It's a very young industry. And we built 3,000 of those in the middle. And then starting when I got into business in the mid-80s, but actually before that, we started to build what you see on the right. It looks a lot different than a regional mall, right? Because what that is is a power center or a, or a modern day shopping center. And what each, each box in that shopping center, what does it represent that used to be in the mall, and particularly in the department store? Each store in there represents, except for a general merchandise store, except for Target or Walmart, each store represents what used to be a department in a department store. Those shopping centers deconstructed the department store. Nick, couldn't you argue that even before the big boxes, the shop retail inside the mall was really the beginning of the deconstruction of the Yes, that store. was the beginning. So, so that gets a little bit into the weeds. But uh, so you had department stores. And then when the developers, and this gets a little complicated, but basically the way that the mall was built was the department store picked where it wanted to go. They picked the developer. The developer gave them free land money to open the store and the right to own their own store. So if there were three department stores, each of them owned their own store. Yeah, all the developer got was everything between the stores. So they had a powerful incentive to build smaller stores, which is where they made their profit. And yes, they started to put in stores that had little pieces of what were in the department stores. And that is kind of the beginning of it, but it really got going when this model was adopted. We're the only country in the world that has this model on the right, oops, as the backbone of its shopping system. And the reason for that is because we're the only country in the world that built the kind of road system we built and has free transferability of land and, and relatively unrestricted zoning. And I could spend a lot more time with you. I've taught in Egypt where the army owns all the land. And the only land that comes available for development is released by the army. And we can spend a lot more time. So that's how the department store started. That little thing, golden rule on the left, that's the original J.C. Penney store in Wyoming. Turned into that store. Sears became, Sears has everything. Largest retailer in the world. And these are some of the really famous department stores around the country. But there were a couple hundred of them. Look how big they were. Look at famous bar. That's a St. Louis. It's probably an 800,000 square foot building. Sold everything. Probably ran the catalog from in there also. So we went from shopping downtown to out in the suburbs. We built those, right? We just went through that. And then it was killed by, ah, I left something out. So in 1959, a drugstore in Washington, D.C. was competing with another drugstore across the street. And the drugstore across the street, which is a small chain called People's Drug, today part of CBS, lowered the price on some vitamins. The vitamins came from a company called Park Davis. And the retailer across the street from People's Drug said, wait a minute, I can't let them do that. I'm going to drop the price lower. And when they dropped the red price lower, what did Park Davis do? Cut them off. Because until 1960, suppliers of goods could vertically price fix. They could, they could name the price that a retailer sold the product at. So if you bought a product from a supplier, they would have you sign an agreement that said you would sell it at X price. And everybody would sell it at the same price. The guy who ran the drugstore that got cut off by Park Davis is a man named Herbert Haft. He was my first boss in this business. I didn't even know 
that in law school I studied the case in 1981, actually in 1979 in constitutional law. It was a seminal vertical price fixing case under the Sherman Act. And when the Supreme Court ruled in 1960 that Park Davis could not cut off the supply, it opened up the era of discount. Without that case, you would never have had Walmart. Every product would be at a list price determined by the manufacturer. There'd be no such thing as a sale. And therefore, there would have been no reason to build something other than the mall. Because the reason they built the strip centers was to cut the costs. The idea was to cut the costs and increase the volume and make your profits up and increase volume. And the consumer benefited. And by the way, that case, it was overturned in a five to four decision by the conservative wing of the Supreme Court seven years ago. And that's why if you go to Walmart today, you'll find products that are exactly the same price as at CVS and Walgreens, because there are certain products that they feel they have to carry where the manufacturer determines the price. You shouldn't be happy about that Supreme Court case. It's an anti-consumer decision that ultimately raises prices. Their logic was the illogic that consumers had enough choices. But of course, what choice do you have if you've got to buy a certain product and the manufacturer dictates to everyone it sells to that it has to sell at a certain price, and they could do that today. So Park Davis was overturned about seven years ago. Without Park Davis, we wouldn't have had this. And with this, it caused that. And with that, was a devastating influence on department stores. So that's a mall in suburban Virginia, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's a million three square foot mall built in the 1970s. And this is what it looks like today. Can you find them all? There's almost four million square feet of retail around that mall today. So would you think the mall is very healthy? Department store sales drop like a rock. And this is what happened. And this is what I saw in 2001 that started me on the journey to what you're seeing tonight. I saw that the Census Department, which reports retail sales, was reporting that department stores had been losing market share since the mid-1980s, and in fact, all the way back to the early 1980s. Which made sense because it all started with Toys R Us in 1975. They were the first category to leave department stores. And every time a category left a department store that had 150 exclusive departments, what did the department store do? It added more apparel. So by the time you got to today, you guys have never seen a full-line department store. They don't exist anymore. The closest thing we have to a full-line department store is Walmart. The department stores became fashion houses. They didn't know what to do with their space because they were getting undercut. Look at the value, look at the value part. The red was going up every year, and it was a straight line, 45 degree angle. So I saw that in 2001, before Amazon was even a factor. So I know Amazon had almost nothing to do with taking down the department stores. The strip center portion of the shopping center business took down the department stores. And if you took down the department stores, what was going to come down with them? The regional malls. Because the whole idea of a regional mall was the department stores drove the traffic into the malls. And if the department stores were no longer relevant, they were drawing less traffic. And if they're drawing less traffic, the malls do less and less business. And by 2007, when the Great Recession hit, to 2016, look what happened. Those colors on the left on the 2007 are all malls. And by 2016, look at the reduction in market capitalization. In less than 10 years, the value of what was left of the mall business was just devastated. Exactly as I predicted in 2001. All right, there was a great recession and there's a pandemic, but these things are going to happen. 
would have happened without them. They just accelerated it. And so as I said, full line department stores became fashion department stores. And all the malls that were built were now mismatched. They were built to be commodity delivering houses and they became fashion houses. And all but a few of them started to fail. So, out of that comes how retail works now, 2021. Here's how it works. 85% of all retail sales are commodity based. They're things you need. The only the other 15 is pleasure based. That's what I call specialty retail. I'm very close to getting the ICSC to adopt this as a critical new definition for shopping centers going forward. The International Council of Shopping Centers. To this day, the main trade organization representing the shopping center industry does not understand this, but I'm very close to getting them to change that. You spend primary household income on commodity purchases. You spend discretionary income and discretionary time on specialty purchases. Do you understand the difference? Like a certain amount of money goes to getting gas, buying clothes, and getting food, right? And whatever you have left over, if you have any left over, is what you have to have fun with, right? And within commodity retail, you're making choices every day between price and convenience. The two major factors that determine where you buy are price and convenience. You trade convenience for price. You pay for convenience. But this is much more sophisticated than just price versus convenience because every one of those, from the 7-Eleven up to the drugstore, to the grocery store, to Walmart, all the way up to Costco, they don't just change the price, they change the quantity, they change the brands, they change the amount you buy. Ultimately, you're paying less per unit. Highest price per unit is on the left, lowest price is on the right, but it's not a one-for-one -one change. The number of SKUs or shopkeepers units or number of products in the store changes. So it is an extremely sophisticated game they play on how they change the merchandise. And that's why retailers are very rarely successful at getting into another business because it's too hard to understand the other business. I used to put Amazon on the bottom. Today I put it on both sides because it actually can deliver the best price or can just deliver what you can't find. And increasingly, retailers have gotten really smart. They don't put stuff on the shelf that doesn't turn. And I said inventory turn, margin. Margin and how quick you turn over the inventory determines how profitable you are. If you have a product that only sells three a week versus one that sells 300 a week, you end up taking the one that sells three a week and you throw it in the warehouse and make you guys order online. Okay? So now Amazon's on both ends. Rarely is it the most, at least expensive. It's usually where you find stuff that you can't find in stores. The other 15% is all about pleasure. 